Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the second lecture of our fall 2020 Coffrey and Logan Center seminar series. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Amlong and I'm the Associate Director, of, uh, Associate Director for Training for the CLC. I wanna welcome everyone who's part of our CLC family here at KU and also extend a special welcome to our friends of the center who are joining us from other departments at KU or other universities or organizations outside of KU. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanna explain a little bit about how today's webinar is going to work. Uh, Dr. Salvatore will be presenting her slides on the screen. We'll have video and voice. And a selection of attendees have been uh, made panelists that have the option of turning their video feed on, while the other attendees uh, will not have the opportunity to have video today. Uh, we ask that everybody mute your microphones at this time, just so we can minimize uh, interruptions. At the end of the talk, we will have some time for questions. Uh, this will be moderated by myself and the other uh, hosts of the session. Uh, in order to do this, we're gonna ask you to submit your question uh, Ideally as a direct message to me, but we're unsure if attendees can do that. So if you need to just send it to the panelists uh, using the chat window on the Zoom uh, call. If your question is selected by the moderators, we will call out the names of attendees and you can unmute your microphone so you can ask your question to Dr. Salvatore. Uh, we may not go in the exact order in which the questions are received and we also won't have time uh, to get to all of them uh, most likely. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce our second speaker for our CLC seminar series. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Jessica Salvatore joining us today. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University, where she's also associate director of the Examining Development Genes and Environment, or the EDGE Laboratory. She received a master's and PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Minnesota, and she completed two postdoctoral fellowships at VCU, one in the Virginia Institute for Psychiatric and Behavioral Genetics and another in the Department of Psychology. And then she stayed at VCU and joined the faculty as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology in 2015. Uh, her expertise and interests intersect developmental psychology, interpersonal relationships, behavioral genetics, and addictive behaviors. And she's particularly interested in the high risk period of emerging adulthood. And she says on her website that the larger goal of her work is to understand how genetic and relationship factors predict trajectories of alcohol misuse uh, with the hope of informing personalized interventions. So really this gene by environment interaction work is, is very cutting edge and very promising in terms of personalized interventions. Her research is currently supported by a prestigious KO1 mentored research scientist award from NIAAA. And she's had previous postdoctoral and predoctoral funding from NIAAA, NIMH and the University of Minnesota. So we're truly lucky today to have Dr. Salvatore joining us. She's one of the field's experts on the intersection between behavioral genetics, development, and addictions. And the title of her talk today is Drunk in Love, Genes, Romantic Relationships, and Alcohol Misuse. On behalf of the CLC, welcome Dr. Salvatore. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that warm introduction and I am excited to meet with you all today and talk about my program of research. Um, so as it was just mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University where I um, am in the Department of Psychology and then also have an affiliate appointment in the Department of Psychiatry. And so as the backdrop for my talk today, I wanted to share with you a story that's stuck with me ever since I heard it some years ago at my now husband's graduation ceremony. The keynote speaker, Lieutenant General Edward Daly, had recounted an episode from when his family moved across the country from one army post to another. And their route took them through his wife's hometown in New Jersey, where they stopped to fill up the tank. And it just so happened that the gas station attendant was Mrs. Daly's high school boyfriend. And as they drove away, General Daly was feeling quite smug. And he asked his wife, aren't you glad you married me? Otherwise you'd be married to a gas station attendant. And not missing a beat, his wife replied, aren't you glad you married me? Otherwise you'd be the one pumping gas. And what I like about this story is how clearly his wife's comeback captures the idea that our partners profoundly influence our actions and outcomes. And this observation is borne out time and time again in the empirical data for outcomes ranging from how, much, how likely we are to be promoted at work to how much we eat, smoke, and drink. And it's this latter question of how our partners shape our drinking that is the focus of my work. Now, we know from decades of epidemiological research that whether one is in a relationship, um, oops, sorry, that whether one is in a relationship with whom one is in a relationship 
is, and the quality of that relationship is likely to influence um, how much someone drinks, as well as their likelihood of developing an alcohol problem. So for example, we know that individuals who are divorced are just over one and a half as likely to have an alcohol use disorder compared to individuals who are stably married. And if a spouse is diagnosed with an alcohol use disorder, one's own risk of developing a problem in the period immediately following is increased tenfold. And finally, involvement in a dissatisfying romantic relationship is associated with a 3.7 fold increased risk of developing an alcohol problem. And the goal of my program of research is to integrate social science theories with genetically informed designs to understand these kinds of effects and investigate why relationship factors are so strongly associated with alcohol problems. So what's so special about genetically informed designs? The short answer is that genetically informed designs provide a unique lens for understanding how the people we love shape our drinking. And the reason for that is that because relationships don't just happen to people, but rather people are actively contributing to them. And so in other words, we're bringing our own unique combination of genes and environmental experiences and exposures together uh, to each new relationship we find ourselves in. And we know from twin and adoption studies that there is a substantial degree of genetic influence in alcohol problems with genetic factors accounting for roughly half of the variation in alcohol use disorders. And so what this suggests is that if we want to understand how the people we love shape our drinking, we also need to consider the role of genetic predispositions in this process. So along these lines, I'll be giving snapshots of my work across three main themes. The first being that genetic effects can operate beyond the skin. The second, that relationship, that the relationship environment can change the nature of genetic effects. And the third, that a romantic partner's genetic makeup might influence our alcohol outcomes. So the snippets of data that I'll be sharing today come from a variety of research designs. And so I wanted to give just a brief overview of the two flavors of genetically informed research that I'll be talking about. So in a latent genetic study, we use information about an individual and their relatives to make inferences about genetic influences. So in a twin study, we're looking at how much twin siblings who vary in whether they share half or all of their genetic variation resemble one another. And an adoption design is another type of latent genetic design where we're looking at resemblance between adoptees and their biological parents to make inferences about genetic and uh, environmental influences. And then finally, we can use information about family history as sort of a, a gross approximation of one's uh, genetic loading. And in contrast, in a molecular genetic study, we are, we're using information about an individual's DNA. So this is um, a measured version of genetic risk as opposed to a latent or inferred um, index of genetic risk. And there are uh, many different kinds of molecular genetic data. And the type that I'll be talking about today is primarily genome-wide genotyping. And so this refers to the process of finding out which genetic variants an individual has basically across the genome. Um, and that's in contrast to more, uh, I guess, historically popular tools like candidate gene studies. So my work incorporates these latent and molecular genetic designs across a range of community, population, and then clinically ascertained samples. And so rather than as I'm going through each study, talk you know, about this, the sample and the methods. I'm gonna kind of give a broad overview of the samples that I use. And then the snippets of data that I'm talking about are in reference to, to these samples. So the first sample is Spit for Science, which is a study of approximately 12,000 emerging adults who were recruited as college freshmen and who've been assessed repeatedly across their college years regarding their behavioral and emotional health. And participants in this study provided salivary DNA samples. Um, and so this sample gives us a picture of how their um, genetic and relationship factors are coming together across this really high risk period of emerging adulthood, um, which we, we know um, from epidemiological work 
is the highest risk period for the onset of alcohol problems. The next study that I'm uh, or in reference to during this talk is Fin Twin 12, which is a study of approximately 5,000 twins who were recruited from Finnish population registries, adolescents, and who've been followed up at multiple points in adolescence and young adulthood. And actually, we just found out um, a couple of weeks ago that uh, an, a new round of data collection was just funded by NIAAA. So we are um, engaged in, in developing the survey for their early midlife assessment. And that's um, something I'm really looking forward to. And so another unique feature of the Fin Twin 12 sample is that it is a molecular genetic study embedded within a latent genetic framework. So there's also molecular genetic data on these twins in addition to the latent or inferred information from um, the, the twin design. The Virginia Adult Twin Study of Psychiatric and Substance Use Disorders, or VATSPUD, is another population-based twin sample. It includes just over 9,000 individuals who were recruited from driver's license registries here in Virginia for whom detailed clinical information were collected across several waves of assessment. And then the last population-based sample that I'll be talking about today um, is actually not a sample at all. It's the entire population of Sweden. And so this makes use of Swedish national registry data, um, which includes over 15 million records um, for individuals from um, legal, pharmacy, medical records, as well as um, more general population registries that link individuals to families, to neighborhoods, et cetera. And I'll be talking more about those registers later on in my talk. And then the final sample that I'll be talking about today is the collaborative study in the genetics of alcoholism sample, which is a clinically ascertained family-based sample. So probands in the COGA sample were recruited from alcohol inpatient um, alcohol treatment clinics. And then from their uh, recruitment of family members uh, occurred. And so um, at this point, it is a three generation study uh, very high risk. These families are um, densely affected by alcohol use disorder. And so in addition to the family-based design, there's also molecular genetic data on this sample. So again, it is like the Finnish twin sample. It is a molecular genetic data, a molecular genetic data set embedded within um, a, a family-based study. So there's information on both latent as well as measured genetic effects. Okay, so turning to our first theme, which is the idea that genetic effects can operate beyond the skin. Um, typically, when we think about how genes influence alcohol outcomes, most people think about within the skin mechanism. So these are things like how quickly alcohol is metabolized, perceptions in the taste of alcohol, um, what our personality is like, or how impulsive we are. But the within the skin pathways are only part of the story. And that's because genetic effects can also operate beyond the skin and influence the types of environments that people encounter, which in turn turn the dial on their risk for problematic alcohol use. And using a number of different study designs in a variety of populations, we find that genetic predispositions for alcohol problems influence the types of relationship environments that people find themselves in. So for example, in uh, inferred genetic work using the Spit for Science sample, again, this is that college age sample in emerging adults, we find that individuals with a genetic predisposition for alcohol use disorder are more likely to exhibit traits and behaviors like impulsivity and conduct problems. These traits and behaviors are in turn associated with a higher likelihood of involvement in a non-exclusive romantic relationship, again, during this emerging adulthood period which um, we've shown uh, across uh, sort of several studies is linked to um, longitudinal increases in alcohol use, uh, alcohol use and problems. And so what this study is really il illustrating is the idea that genetic effects can operate beyond the skin to influence the types of environments people find themselves in, which in turn are associated with um, increased alcohol use. And we found a similar pattern of effects across an array of relationship outcomes using a variety of both twin and adoption designs. And this is in the Virginia adult twin study sample, as well as in the Swedish national registries. 
And so we've um, found, for example, that genetic factors that predispose individuals to alcohol misuse and problems also decrease their probability of getting married, staying married, and increase the likelihood of experiencing severe relationship conflict. So the bottom line here is that people who are predisposed to alcohol problems are also just less likely to find themselves in the types of relationship environments that are protective against the development of alcohol use disorder. Okay, so that is sort of a, a discouraging story. The people who are most at risk are also least likely to benefit from these protective environments. Um, but of course, these associations between one's predisposition, one's uh, family history, one's genetic loading is only probabilistic. It's not deterministic. And so just as this marble can end up in different locations, depending on which path is taken, not everyone with a predisposition towards alcohol problems is going to find themselves in an unhappy or unstable relationship. And so that brings us to our second theme, which is the idea that the environment can moderate genetic effects and alter the ability for a genetic predisposition to express itself. And sort of the simplest example of this uh, to sort of set up the findings that I'll go through next is that even someone with a really strong, uh, heavy genetic loading for alcohol problems, if they never take a drink, they're never gonna develop a problem. And so we can think about that as sort of the first environment or you know, those sort of first choice points um, when we were thinking about how genes and environment are coming together that can alter the impact of genetic effects on um, behavioral outcomes like alcohol use. Okay, so relationship factors can also moderate genetic influences on alcohol outcomes in what is commonly known as gene by environment interaction. And one of the earliest examples of gene by environment interaction for alcohol problems actually came from the marriage literature. And in this sample of female-female twin pairs, um, Andrew Heath and colleagues found that genetic influences on alcohol use were more pronounced when women were unmarried. And in contrast, these genetic influences were reduced when women were married. And so what we're seeing here is that the risk associated with this genetic predisposition is attenuated in the context of marriage. And there are lots of probable mechanisms that it can account for this. And this may be, uh, for example, because spouses actively monitor and control one another's drinking, um, or because the social role expectations associated with marriage are incongruent you know, with um, nights out of, of heavy drinking. So in a twin study of gene by environment interaction, patterns of correlations among siblings and twin pairs or siblings, are used to make inferences about how these latent genetic influences change as a function of different environments. And so a key question um, I would say that's really escalated um, and is really at the forefront of um, you know, precision medicine initiatives is how do we change or how do we translate these findings and knowledge from a latent genetic um, framework into a molecular genetic framework? Um, you know, so how can we understand who might benefit the most, I guess, in this case, from being in a committed romantic relationship? And questions like this really do underlie the logic of precision medicine efforts, trying to tailor um, treatments, prevention, intervention um, to individuals' own personalized genetic, uh, or not genetic profile necessarily, but Genetic profiles are part of that broader risk profile um, that is um, sort of the goal of precision medicine um, tailoring. So um, for a few years, researchers conducting gene by environment interaction research used, using a molecular genetic approach employed um, candidate gene designs. So researchers would select genetic variants in genes of purported biological relevance. So these are the things that probably many of us have heard about, serotonin transporter genes, um, dopamine uh, genes, dopamine receptor genes, and examine whether their effects were modified by the environment. However, uh, this approach was really hampered by type 1 error and failures to replicate. And moreover, this one-by-one -one candidate gene approach is really at odds 
with our understanding of the genetic architecture of a complex trait or behavior like alcohol use or alcohol use disorder. Because we know that um, alcohol use disorder is influenced by hundreds or thousands of genetic variants that are spread across the genome, each of small effect. And that idea and principle is illustrated here. So this is the um, uh, Manhattan plot from the Genome-Wide Association Study from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, uh, Genome-Wide Association Study of Alcohol Dependence that came out uh, a couple of years ago now. Each dot re represents a genetic variant arranged by chromosomal position here on the x-axis. And then the height of each dot, which gives it sort of this um, New York, Manhattan silhouette, uh, if, you, if you have uh, hits, I guess I should say, uh, represents the p-value for that association between the genetic variant and the, the outcome, so alcohol use disorder in this case. And what you see here is a big effect for ADH1B, which is involved in alcohol metabolism. And then um, there are much more modest effects that are spread uh, throughout the genome. And those are these sort of sub-threshold sub, um, uh, sub variants that you see scattered about here. And in recent years, genome-wide polygenic scoring has emerged as one way to index an individual's genetic loading for alcohol use and problems. And so this approach is using molecular genetic data across the genome to calculate a single score that reflects the number of risk alleles that an individual carries. And this is weighted by information from large-scale genome-wide association studies in order to create these personalized indices of genetic risk. And so in work led by my colleague um, and friend, Dr. Peter Barr, we examined whether relationship status moderated genome-wide polygenic scores to predict a series of alcohol outcomes in young adults. And this is in the Finnish twin sample. So again, a population-based sample um, measured in early adulthood. And so um, consistent with the effects observed in the twin study, that Andrew Heath conducted that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, we found that relationship status um, moderated the effect of these polygenic scores on drinking frequency, intoxication frequency, as well as alcohol dependence symptoms. And so as you'll see depicted here, the polygenic scores were much more predictive for the three alcohol outcomes when people were not in a relationship. So that's shown here in these red lines compared to when they were in a relationship. And so, in other words, the effect of these polygenic scores were attenuated in the context of um, the, the protective committed relationship environment. And so a related avenue that I, as a developmental psychologist, have been really interested in um, uh, pursuing is understanding how these gene by environment interaction effects for relationship status might change across development. And more specifically, we recently examined whether marriage confers a protective benefit against alcohol misuse when people get married relatively young. So in view of prior evidence that early marriage is associated with a number of negative consequences for um, across both economic, health, um, educational outcomes, we hypothesized that early marriage um, might not have a protect as protective of an effect um, on individuals and moderating genetic risk as marriage that occurs um, more typically on time. And of course, on time is always with reference to um, the culture that we are in. Um, and I'll talk more about that in the, in the next couple of slides. And so we tested this hypothesis in a subsample of young adults from the, cl the clinically ascertained collaborative study on the genetics of alcoholism. So again, this sample um, is a family-based sample where the original proband was recruited from an inpatient alcohol treatment clinic and um, from there families were recruited and so these are, are pretty highly affected families so we considered a pretty um, a, a sample that's enriched for risk. And so um, consistent with our hypothesis we found evidence that how marriage moderates genetic influences on alcohol outcomes and in this case we were looking at heavy episodic drinking frequency changes across development. And specifically, we found evidence for a pathogenic gene by environment interaction effect when people got married relatively early. 
So among those in the sample who were married by age 21, which represented about 10% of the sample, heavy episodic drinking was highest for those with higher polygenic scores compared to those with lower polygenic scores. And interestingly, um, as a developmental psychologist, what we saw over time when we followed these individuals until they were um, hitting more like the mid-20s, I think we stopped at age 25, is that this gene by environment interaction effect actually decayed over time. So um, sort of consistent with the idea that uh, once marriage becomes a more normative um, social role for people to adopt, that it starts to um, have these, well, in, in this case, a less pathogenic effect. And so we start to see that transition to where marriage starts to be protective for individuals drinking behavior. Okay, so the take home point here is that relationship factors can amplify or offset the alcohol related risk posed by an individual's pre genetic predispositions. And that these effects can look um, quite different across development. So it's not ever just genes by environment, it's genes by environments by development. Because the environments that matter um, can be more or less salient across development. Um, and so we always have to keep sort of the developmental salience in, in account when we're thinking about gene by environment interaction effects. So up until now, I've really been taking an individual level perspective to look at how alcohol related genetic predispositions influence the types of relationships that individuals find themselves in, and then how relationship factors can moderate genetic influences on alcohol outcomes. But in any type of relationship, um, both people are coming together, each with their own genetic predisposition. And so this is bringing me to my third and final theme of my talk today, which is looking at social genetic effects or how a romantic partner's genetic makeup might influence one's own alcohol outcomes. So social genetic effects have a long history in evolutionary and um, human genetics literatures more broadly, and is related to the idea that genes influence phenotypes beyond the body as part of what Richard Dawkins termed the extended phenotype. And I think it's easiest to sort of digest the idea of social genetic effects um, visually. So I'm gonna start first by um, quickly going over the standard quantitative genetic partitioning of a trait, which is sort of the conventional direct genetic effects model. And so what we have here is an individual's phenotype or outcome, in this case, alcohol use disorder. And in the standard quantitative genetic partitioning model, what we are doing is we are looking at the degree to which additive genetic effects and then um, environmental effects account for variation in this trait in the population. And the wrinkle that a social genetic effects approach um, adds to this is trying to understand how the genotype of a social partner might influence the um, phenotype of uh, our proband or our target individual. And so um, this schematic here is illustrating social genetic effects, which uh, I should mention in other literatures are also known or referred to as indirect genetic effects. And um, so the, the effect of the social partner's genotype so these are the social partners uh, genetic influences. They have an indirect effect on our focal individual's phenotype and that is transmitted via the phenotype of the social partner. So if we think about the um, social partner's genetic predisposition towards alcohol use disorder, that in turn influences the social partner's um, alcohol use disorder risk or likelihood of uh, having that phenotype, which in turn becomes an environment for our proband or our focal individual's um, uh, risk for the alcohol use disorder phenotype. And so a 2017 study conducted, conducted using a rodent model was what really first piqued my interest in examining social genetic effects for substance use disorders. So in this study, Amelie Baud et al. Um, varied the housing arrangements of inbred strains of mice. So these are um, mice that are clones, basically, of one another, genetic clones. And so they were then able to partition the variation 
for a series of behavioral and health phenotypes into direct and social genetic effects. So again, direct genetic effects are the effects of one's own genotype on one's own outcomes, if you're a mouse, and then um, the effect of your cage mate, in this case, uh, if you're a mouse, uh, um, genetic makeup on their social partners or their the proband pro -band mouse's um, outcomes. And so what we found using this really nice experimental design in mice was that even after accounting for the effects of one's own genotype, so the, the mouse's own direct genetic effects, the genotype of a cage mate accounted for a non-trivial portion of the variation in a series of health and addiction related outcomes, including wound healing, stress, anxiety, and helplessness. And um, ever since that study came out in 2017, there have been a series of really interesting pieces coming out looking at social genetic effects in human samples using these genome-wide polygenic scores that I talked about a few slides ago. And so, um, what they, what these different studies have shown, shown and I'm just um, putting up a sort of a brief illustration of um, exemplar studies here, is that above and beyond genetic predispositions for educational attainment that parents transmit to their offspring, the non-transmitted parental alleles, so the alleles that parents don't share with their offspring, are associated with an enriched environment. So the idea here is that um, the non-transmitted parental alleles are providing a sort of social genetic effect of parents on um, children's subsequent uh, uh, environmental exposures that are in turn associated with um, offspring um, educational attainment themselves. In the ad health sample, um, ben Domingue and colleagues found that friends' genetic predispositions predict one's own educational attainment. And again, this holds after accounting for one's direct uh, direct genetic effects, so the influence of one's own genetic predispositions on educational attainment. And then finally, from uh, the marital literature, marriage to a spouse who, can, who carries the protective A allele of um, the ADH1B SNP, um, RS number listed here, which is sort of uh, the strongest signal we have um, on an individual genetic variant level for alcohol problems, that these individuals drink less compared to those who are married to a spouse who is not a carrier of this protective A allele. So obviously in humans, we're not randomly assigning people to their social partners or, or to their spouses. Um, but we can look at whether a spouse's genetic predispositions influence alcohol-related outcomes. And um, my colleagues and I have done this using latent genetic methods in the Swedish national registries. And so what we were able to do is we were able to look at, um, or this blue line rather, captures the, the effect of the probands, alcohol use disorder, genetic predisposition, predisposition on their own alcohol use disorder outcome. And then we are also able to look at the effect of the spouse's alcohol use disorder or genetic predisposition um, on the proband or focal individual's alcohol use disorder outcome. And that is denoted there. And so I'm gonna talk about this study in a series of steps, but I first just wanna take a step back and talk a bit about the Swedish registries and how record linkage works. So um, Sweden, like all of the Nordic countries, um, maintain incredibly detailed population-based registers. And so these include lifetime data with um, about demographic as well as health outcomes. And these can all be linked um, via sort of the equivalent of the, um, the social security number, this, 10, uh, this unique 10-digit code that is assigned to um, Swedish individuals at um, birth or at immigration. And so in this particular study, we operationalized alcohol use disorder genetic pre or predispositions using parental history of alcohol use disorder. And we're able to do that through record linkage because we are able to, using this total population register, link parents to their children. And then information about alcohol use disorder is ascertained from um, the uh, medical, legal, and pharmacy records. So that's really where we're getting our information 
um, regarding the substance use outcomes. So um, I should note that this, because of how we are obtaining this data, these are individuals who are pretty severely affected. Um, and oftentimes they, they pop up first in the legal registry for getting in, in, in trouble basically um, while intoxicated. All right, so in the Swedish population, what we find is that marriage to a spouse with an alcohol use disorder predisposition, again, operationalized and indexed using parental history of alcohol use disorder, is associated with an increased risk of the proband developing alcohol use disorder to marriage. And importantly, this spousal effect holds after we control for the proband's own alcohol use disorder predisposition, as well as the correlation between spouses' predispositions. Because um, as we know from uh, other work, including my own, uh, individuals who have a parental history of alcohol use disorder are also more likely to partner with someone who also has um, a higher risk history. So it was important to, to really control for, for this effect or that correlation between spouses. And we then conducted a series of robustness analyses aimed at probing whether family socioeconomic status, the spouse's alcohol use disorder status themselves, or contact with the spouse's alcohol use disorder affected parents might um, explain these effects that we found. And in fact, none of these alternative explanations um, substantially impacted or altered that spousal effect that I talked about on the previous slide. And so in other words, the increased risk associated with marriage to a spouse with an AUD predisposition is not explained by socioeconomic status, the spouse's own alcohol use disorder status or contact with the spouse's parents, which we index using with a measure of distance to parents. In this latter part, I should just elaborate a little bit was we were trying to rule out the possibility that um, social transmission from in-laws to probands was accounting for this effect. So that's what the, um, the contact with spouse's parents analysis was meant to, to probe. So having established this effect between a spouse's AUD predisposition and one's own risk of developing an alcohol problem during marriage, our next step was really to try to understand the mechanism through which this effect was taking place. Um, and so, as I had mentioned, we operationalized here AUD predispositions using parental history. And parents typically provide both genes and a rearing environment for their offspring. And so these spousal predisposition effects, of course, reflect the melding or mix of both of these influences. And so what we wanted to do next was leverage um, the Swedish national data and our ability to, to um, use an extended family design to understand the relative strength of each of these influences. Again, to try to understand um, the mechanism underlying the spousal effect. And so um, we used, or the type of extended family design that we use for this study, we refer to as a not lived with family design. And the, not, the logic here is very similar to an adoption design. And what we're trying to disentangle is whether the risk associated with the spouse's AUD predisposition and likelihood of developing alcohol use disorder during marriage reflects um, first or either the effects of the spouse having a a genetic predisposition towards alcohol use disorder. So this would reflect a social genetic effect or um, the psychological, psychological consequences of having grown up with an AUD affected parent. And so this is what we call um, a so social rearing environment effect. And so we probe this by looking at alcohol use disorder resemblance between probands and their spouse's parents in two different groups. So the first group was um, a group of couples where one spouse did not live with or grow up with their biological parents. And so this was operationally defined as living fewer than 80% uh, of the time with their biological parents prior to age 15. And so we call this the not live with parent um, family sample. And so in this case, the spouse's not lived with parents provided genes, but not a rearing environment to the spouse. And so any AUD resemblance between the probands and their spouses not lived with parents would be consistent with a social genetic effect. 
And then in the second group, which we term the lived with parent families group, the spouse grew up with his or her parents. And so in this case, the, spouse, the spouses lived with parents provided both genes and a rearing environment to the spouse. And so alcohol use disorder resemblance between probands and the spouses lived with parents for this study group would reflect the, the combined effect of the spouse's AUD genetic predisposition, as well as the ex environmental exposure of having grown up with an alcohol use disorder affected parent. And so in this case, um, the, er, the operational death of parents was sort of inverse parallel to the not lived with parent sample, meaning that the, they had to live with their, um, uh, their parents for more than 80% of the years prior to age 15. And again, uh, living arrangements are all ascertained from the Swedish population registries um, for which information is gathered annually. And we use logistic regression to examine whether the risk associated with the spouse's AUD predisposition differed as a function of whether the spouse um, lived with or did not live with their biological parents um, growing up as tested with an interaction. And in fact, we found um, that the risk associated with a spouse's AUD predisposition did differ as a function of who they grew up with. And a spouse's AUD predisposition significantly predicted proband AUD only when the spouse came from a lived with parent family. So only when the spouse inherited both genes as well as a rearing environment for alcohol use disorder. In contrast, the association between a spouse's um, AUD predisposition and proband alcohol use disorder during marriage was not significant when a spouse came from a not lived with parents family. So the weight of evidence here is much more in favor of this being an environmental effect as opposed to a pure social genetic effect. And so, you know, what does this mean? Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm in the field and especially in, um, within these observational molecular genetic designs to uh, characterize and understand social genetic effects. But the key limitation of these um, samples where they can't disentangle social genetic effects from social rearing environment effects is that the social partner's rearing environment is confounded with their genetic predisposition potentially. And so we can't say for sure in those kinds of designs that this is that a social genetic effect, even though it's measured with a molecular genetic measure, is actually reflecting anything about genetics because indeed genes also reflect the environment. So um, I'm sort of putting like an asterisk on, on our understanding and interpretation of these other studies. And we really need to think of other ways to disentangle these um, different mechanisms before we go sort of whole hog in calling them social genetic effects. And then um, I think the, the bigger um, uh, take home point of this is that our findings really go beyond the typical social contagion models to demonstrate that marrying a spouse with an alcohol use disorder um, predisposition um, someone who was raised in a home with alcohol problems, that that, that has a pretty um, long reach into impacting the risk of other individuals. And, and that's because um, the impact of growing up with an AUD affected parent uh, influences not only the offspring's risk, but the future marriage par marital partners of these offspring. And so when we're thinking about, you know, how do we disrupt the social transmission of alcohol use disorder, we need to think more broadly than simple person-to-person um, -person contagion. We have to think about um, how these effects um, cross not only generations, but um, other types of family relationships, including um, marital partners, spouses. And so um, I just would like to close and um, you know, really try to reflect and, and bring us back to what this work means in a practical sense. Um, so I, like many of you, uh, when you tell people what you do for a living and that you study addictions, um, people are often naturally curious. And of course, when I tell them, I also study the intersection of relationships and genetics and um, addiction, uh, people have, you know, lots of stories and 
This is often stemming from um, their own experiences, the experiences of others in their family or their friends. And, and so it's, it's really personal. And as a you know, federally funded scientist, I'm always thinking about how we can translate these basic science findings into actionable um, steps. So really taking a step back to think about what it means. And, and really for me as a, um, a relationship scientist, one of the takeaways from this work is that investment in relationships is probably one of the highest impact ways that we can affect people's trajectories of um, developing or recovering from problems. And um, obviously this is not a small task, uh, teeing people up, especially people who might, um, due to their family history or their genetic loading, um, have problems forming or maintaining relationships that are stable, high quality and satisfying. Um, but I think that that investment is worth it. I mean, the fact that we can tamp down on the influence of genetic predispositions to uh, like with something, I mean, not as simple as marriage, but when we think about the, the public health impact that um, positive relationships can have on people, um, I think the payoff is, is pretty great and, and frankly something that we can, um, like there are interventions and uh, tools that we already have to promote relationship health. I mean, I don't even think it's, it's definitely not limited to marriages. Um, this can be much broader to include any kind of committed partnership. Um, but, you know, that is something that we can have an impact on today. We don't have to wait for, uh, you know, a precision medicine, uh, drug, pharmaco pharmacological intervention. Um, we already have an environmental intervention that is also mapped to what we know um, includes genetic risk factors. And of course, as a behavioral geneticist, I realize that it's sort of a, a weird conclusion to come to that you know, the environment is the place to intervene. But um, I would say that my, the deeper that I've gotten into behavioral genetics and the more I understand about the pathways through which genes influence alcohol and other addictive outcomes, um, it's really deepened my appreciation for the environment. So um, you know, as it was mentioned in terms of my background, like my, my background is in you know, developmental psychology and my training was really in the environment, uh, my doctoral work. And then, you know, I thought I was gonna, you know, march off into the, into the future and get, and get the answers with genes. But in fact, that work has really brought me back to the environment and understanding um, those pathways and how genes and environment work together. So um, with that, I just wanted to end on a final note of appreciation, both for everyone's attention here, as well as NIAAA, which has, um, funded both my K awards as well as um, uh, two new R01s, the U10 that funds the, the collaborative study in the genetics of alcoholism, and the R01 that funds the Swedish Alcohol Use Disorder Projects, as well as the Templeton, Templeton Foundation, which has um, funded some, some of the, actually the work that I did on social genetic effects that I talked about today. And then finally, I'm really appreciative of my amazing lab, um, which I co-direct with uh, Danielle Dick and um, pictured here are all of us um, uh, at RSA a couple of years ago. And um, it's really an amazing team. And I mean, I know you guys have an amazing team too at, at Kansas. And so I'm, I'm smiling because I just know how much um, uh, fun, good uh, collaborators um, make the work that we do. Um, all of the collaborators on the, the COGA study, Dr. Ken Kendler and the Swedish National Registry team, um, also an amazing set of um, collaborators and collaborations, as well as the collaborators on the Finnish twin projects. So um, especially Dr. Jaco Caprio and Dick Rose. So with that, um, I will close and I'm happy to take any questions that you all might have. So thank you very much. I'm very excited to uh, see the R01 funding and I'm sorry that I left that off of your, your introduction. You gotta get your website updated with those big grants. It's, it's time to do that for sure. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, we're not, we probably won't have time to get to all of them, but the first question um, actually was from uh, John, one of our attendees. So we're gonna unmute him. He actually had two questions. So if we could just ask one of the two, just so we have enough time, that'd be great. Well, thank you. 
I was interested particularly in you discussed marriage, but you really didn't break it down in terms of are these are you strictly speaking about sort of heterosexual marriages or were you studying across the board relationships? Yes. Okay. So I have a, a few answers to that because it's operationalized different across different samples. Or I mean, I guess you should say we have different information across different samples. Um, in the Finnish twin studies, it was um, irrespective of, you know, um, same sex or opposite sex relationships. And those were um, not necessarily legal marriages. They were um, uh, participants indicated basically whether they were in a committed romantic partnership. Um, in the Swedish registries, um, so um, uh, same-sex marriage is legal in Sweden, and so that's this should um, include those couples because we oftentimes what we do, uh, and oftentimes also in response to reviewer comments, is basically run sensitivity analyses, you know, inclusive um, of all groups, and then uh, sensitivity analyses looking at whether effects are different across different groups. And typically we see um, the same pattern of effects. So um, marriage in the registries is, is it's, it's information that we have. That's what we have to refer to legal marriage in that case. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, next we're going to go to Adrian with a question. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I just was curious, I wrote it down, how do you get access to that incredible uh, Swedish database so that you can, when you're doing research and... Yeah, so um, that has really been um, a fortuitous sort of happenstance. So one of my postdoctoral mentors, Ken Kendler, he had um, initiated the collaboration with uh, Jan and Christina Sundquist at uh, Lund University. And um, so it's really through my affiliation with Ken that I work with the Swedish, um, Swedish registries. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Rich. Thank you, Jessica. That was a really nice um, presentation. Um, it's kind of something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about lately, and it seems like you kind of wrapped up in this direction. I'm curious about your thoughts. So are, are um, substance use, kind of individual level substance use interventions that focus on the individual's relationship with the drug, are they misinformed? So this has actually been like one of my uh, beefs, I guess, with, with interventions is that like it's, um, uh, I mean, obviously there are many different orientations that clinicians take. Um, so I don't mean to treat interventions as some sort of like monolithic uh, group. But um, I mean, when you look at the, um, the efficacy of uh, like a, a couple's intervention to substance use versus an individual um, sort of intervention, the, like you will have, you will see there's higher success when you use um, a couples based approach. Because I mean, these patterns and dynamics, they are not just being reinforced by the individual sort of, let's say physiological response to the drug or their own um, like emotional um, uh, sort of experience. And you know, if you adopt sort of the KUB model of people trying to get themselves um, back to homeostasis, by through use, um, there are many uh, features of people's environments and the social partner that people spend the most time with is far and away their spouse and their leisure time. Um, and so I think that the short answer to your question is, I, I don't know if they're like misdirected because I think obviously there are individual things, but I think there are also broader environmental um, considerations that that need to be uh, more systematically addressed um, as part of interventions. And I mean, I see that a lot too in interventions that are kind of based on, um, uh, well, on, on college campuses, for example. I mean, risk is not just uh, who you are, risk is like who you're hanging out with. So, um, so yeah. 
Okay, we'll go to Fernanda next. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was very interesting. And I wanted to ask you uh, about, I'm, I think I'm just curious about your opinion as a researcher. So we have uh, two big trends worldwide today. So we have genetic tests that are uh, uh, pretty popular and we also have dating apps. Uh, so people are using a lot, uh, these two resources. So uh, using your best ability to predict uh, the future, uh, do you think that these two practices are going to like, come together? And what, are, what is your opinion as a researcher about this possible partnership? Yeah, so, and this is completely as a, a joke, but a few years ago, a friend and I bought the uh, domain site, um, GYE Harmony. Um, as a sort of um, joke <laughs> for that. Um, so uh, I'll say I've, I've thought about it. Um, you know, there are, there are lots of things that go into spousal selection that, that don't have to do with genetics um, or that are genetically influenced traits, but that um, uh, wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily have a, a test for them. Um, but I certainly, and I mean, I know I've spent a lot of time thinking about like, well, what would like a, a, a partnership with, uh, like with Tinder, with like match, like, what would that look like to incorporate, um, genes? Cause I mean, I know, well, historically anyways, I know that match had a research arm. Um, so, but I, I don't have any concrete ideas yet, but if you have any, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Hey, just in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to stop there with the questions. Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of the Coffer and Logan Center, we want to thank you, Dr. Salvatore, for a wonderful presentation, for uh, bringing in uh, many different fields, you know, interpersonal relationships, developmental psychology, genetics. I think it's a real uh, interesting area of, of intersection for your work. Um, I want to just to remind everyone that we have one more uh, presentation this fall. Dr. Priscilla Louis from S Southern Methodist University We'll be presenting on issues surrounding culture and um, sort of racism and other systemic forces around uh, substance use, particularly in Hispanic populations. So that'll be on November 20th. Uh, and we can um, either post the link in the chat window or you can also visit addiction.ku.edu slash events for the registration in information for that talk. And so I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Salvatore, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone also for um, joining us this afternoon or this morning. Thanks, everyone.